Yes. Taku Harato has joined from Japan. Okay. You know these folks, all of them. Yes, yes. And now I think our another friend from Hungary will join. Okay, yeah, we yes, are. Uh, Taku also is an alumina technologist and uh, is working long time in, in Japanese aluminum industry. Okay, so we have a global audience. That's good. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Now, as a gentleman, I think. But uh, last uh, last month, I made a very big mistake. Uh, yeah. You let me know about the schedule. But yes. the previous one was uh, Indian time. So mm -hmm. I thought it must be Indian time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Indian time. G -G -G. Yeah, but yeah. They, this time, and the last my time was uh, yes. uh, Greenwich time. <laughs> yeah. I made a mistake last time. Yeah, 10 30 GMT. And what's your yeah. time, Subodh, at your place? And right now it's uh, 5 30 a.m. Oh, early morning. Oh, yeah. Early yeah. Morning. Pretty early, so <laughs> okay. Mark Dupis is also there. Very good. Welcome, Mark. Hey, hey Ma I know Mark well. Yeah, <laughs> I work with him. He's giving a big, uh, big talk, big lecture in Dubai on uh, alumina electrolysis. Yeah, yeah, he's a smelter, leading specialist on smelter. Yeah, he's very well known. Yeah, I see him every year at the TMS. Yeah. So I will just two minutes, I will talk and your presentation will start. All right. So another minute and we'll start. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, gentlemen ladies and gentlemen so we have today the presentation this 11th uh, ibas uh, uh, 13th i think 13th ibas series presentation by dr subodh das he is one of the leading uh, specialists and leading experts in aluminium of aluminium industry and uh, uh, he will introduce during his presentation and uh, we will run his recorded presentation which will be about 28 to 20 30 minutes and then there will be a question answer session maybe uh, dr das would like to talk few uh, sentences uh, before the questions answer and dr das is uh, in usa and he works there and he has a very long experience in aluminum industry Mr. Subodha, uh, Dr. Subodha, you want to introduce yourself before presentation? Uh, you can say a few words. Yeah, but good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Subodh Das, and I have been in the aluminum business for quite a long time, almost approaching 50 years. And, and I have two passionate topics that I work on these days, is aluminum recycling and bauxite residue. So this talk today is about the bauxite residue the mitigation and what can we do about box residue uh, to make our aluminum industry even more sustainable. Okay, very good. So let's start. Uh, Priyanka, please, you can start playing the recorded presentation. And yes, then sir. there will be a question answer session. Goodbye. Priyanka, please start. My name is Subodh Das. I'm calling you from St. Louis, Missouri, USA. And I would like to talk to you about the red mud or the bauxite residue. And the title of my talk is Aluminium Sustainability Dilemma. The red behind the green aluminum. And I thank the IBAS for giving me the opportunity to give this lecture. Little bit about my background. Um, my name is Subodh Das. I'm from India originally. 
I now am settled in the US St. Louis since 1971. I graduated from IIT Kanpur in the metallurgical engineering and I am I received my PhD from University of Michigan in 1974. I have been in the aluminum business for over 50 years. 25 of those years have been the industrial world where I worked for major aluminum companies all over the world. And then the next 10 years had been my academic career at the University of Kentucky. And last 15 years, I have been involved with the uh, an entrepreneurial company, Phoenix LLC, that I founded in 2008. I have worked in all fields of aluminum, starting from bauxite residue to aluminum recycling. And as I have spent my many years in the business, I'm currently passionate about two items, passionate about sustainability of aluminum industry that we all love, as well as the sustainability part of it. In my opinion, the sustainability talk has been dilute, diluted to many, many conversations. In my mind, there are only two things that really contribute to the sustainable aluminum industry. One is the bauxite residue or the red mud, and we'll talk about that uh, in this next 45 minutes. And other one, which is a global problem, other one is the low recycling rate of used beverage cans, which is around 45% in the US, and that is that is landfilling $2 billion a year, and someday we'll talk about that as well. So back to aluminum. Aluminum is $120 billion industry globally, and 60 million metric tons a year, and at $2,000 per metric ton approximately. That's how it comes to 120 billion. So let's talk about aluminum. It's an abundant metal in the earth crust that but exists in oxidized form as bauxite ore. Bauxite mining is done first, then by alumina refining by bare process, and then aluminum smelting hall hero process. We're using four tons of bauxite for every two tons of aluminum, alumina for about one ton of aluminum. So when we melt, uh, when we produce aluminum, normally we're using anywhere from 13, uh, 13,000 to 18,000 kilowatt hours per ton of uh, electric energy uh, to make aluminum. And the average greenhouse gas is about 12 tons of carbon dioxide per ton of uh, aluminum. Aluminum is capable of recycling 100% and end the life in most product, but not in all products. And some products, even those capable in some parts of the world like US, uh, UBCs recycle less than 50%. So when we make aluminum, what are the undesirable products we make? We make aluminum bauxite tailings, we make bauxite residue, we spend we make spend pot lining, and we make draws. While the majority of the conversations today will be bauxite residue, other three items of bauxite tailings or spent pot lines and draws, although important but not as important as bauxite residue, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that in the future meetings. So bauxite residue and sustainability, I think they're intertwined. Um, when the industry talks about sustainability, we quickly move on to low carbon aluminum. And I understand why, because one to two percent of global electricity is, is used uh, is used to to make aluminum, and we want to have low carbon impact. So we aim from lowering the carbon dioxide from 14 tons per ton to four four tons to ton, and immediately we start talking about two things on low carbon aluminum: hydro power and inert amyl. And in my opinion, low carbon 
is not always sustainable by itself. It includes other factors such as bauxite residue, and we'll talk about that in detail. However, in my definition, sustainable aluminum includes the low carbon. So we need to focus on sustainability and not be over obsessed by low carbon aluminum and super obsessed by hydroelectricity and inert anode. And hydroelectricity, why we shouldn't be obsessed? Less than 10% of the global aluminum is made by hydroelectric power and the chances of increasing the share is not very high. Actually, with the drought and climate change, it may be even lower. And the inert anode, and all the 80% of the aluminum is made using coal or natural gas. Inert anode, exciting technology. We have been working for a long time. You and I worked in 1974. And we have 200 smelters in the world. I don't see how they all be retrofitted by inert anode technology in next 10 years to have a dramatic impact. Maybe useful for new construction, but not for existing production. So having said that, uh, we proudly say that 75% of all aluminum ever produced globally is still in the use, which is valid statement. But we clearly forget to mention or acknowledge the fact, something that's also important, is that 95% of the bauxite residue, red mud, ever produced is not in use. And that is our plastic island situation. Bauxite residue, in my mind, is the most important sustainability challenge, challenge, challenge facing the global aluminum industry. In my mind, there's no such thing as sustainable aluminum industry without mitigating the bauxite residue issues. This is not new to, to my audience, but just as a reference, uh, we take bauxite, we crush it and mill it, and then we do the uh, extraction using sodium hydroxide at 145 to 240 Celsius, depending upon the quality of bauxite. And we filter it and we make the infamous red mud. And then we make hydroxide, we cool it, and then we crystallize it, and we add some water, and then we make hydrous uh, aluminum oxide, which we calcine, and that yields the anhydrous smelting grade um, alum aluminum oxide alumina. <clears throat> so red mud is a product of making alumina from bauxite. Two tons of bauxite for every ton of alumina made based upon strictly stoichiometric. Now this slide is also very familiar to all of us. Uh, we take alumina and we add consumable carbon anode and then we put lots of electricity and make aluminum. So three points I'm making here. First is that uh, anode, which is carbon-based, uh, which is consumed during the process and makes carbon dioxide. That's the main contention, contention of high carbon dioxide product. And we use a lot of electricity, which is mostly made from coal and natural gas. So by replacing carbon anode by inert anode, obviously we'll cut back the oxidation of uh, carbon dioxide, but also will limit the heat of combustion and requiring more electricity. And electricity coming from non-fossil fuel will help us. But having said that, likelihood of achieving any one of these inert anode or by hydropower is not likely because most of the world is not on hydropower, will not be in a hydropower, cannot be in hydropower, and inert anode technology, while it's useful, exciting, and challenging, is not the answer to retrofit 200 existing aluminum smelter. Now, I published an article in 2011 in Light Metal Age, and I have outlined 10 factors that in my mind contribute to the sustainability. Going sequentially, uh, we start with bauxite mining that gives the bauxite tailing. Then we refine alumina, bauxite to alumina and gives you bauxite, re bauxite residue or red mud. And that's the main conversation today. 
uh, obviously we generate power to to electrochemically decompose aluminum oxide and that gives you carbon dioxide uh, <clears throat> emission. We make anode, uh, carbon-based anode, petroleum coke and coal tar pitch. And while we're making the anode, it makes a product for combustion POC. Now aluminum smelting, uh, we have carbon dioxide emission, we have PFCs per fluorocarbon and spent part line. A great uh, progress has been made in reducing PFC by operational means and progress has been made, significant progress has been made on treating the spent part line and more, more focus in carbon dioxide emission. Uh, so that's, that's important. And then moving on to aluminum melting and casting, we make dross and salt cake, and a lot of effort has, has happened globally with success. And then when you come to recycling, we either downgrade, meaning that product made for aerospace of automotive are not useful in, in that application. So we downgrade that to maybe building products. And landfill, which is significant globally, but especially significant in the US where uh, more than 50% of aluminum can sheet made is landfill, uh, putting about $2 billion a year in landfill. Uh, we have estimated the cumulative amount of aluminum cans or aluminum that has been landfills close to $100 billion. So having said that, the two main passions I have is to what wish to talk about bauxite residue and the low used beverage can recycling rate in the US. In my mind, the demonstration of the plastic island in Pacific changed the view of people about plastic. Same trouble may be brewing for us in bauxite residue and saying that, yeah, sustainable bauxite, sustainable aluminum is not possible with all the issues that we have had with bauxite residue and progress is slow, but not fast enough to make a significant impact in the near future. So bauxite residue is, is the number one problem we have that we need urgent solution. The solution of bauxite residue is just like climate change the world. For aluminum world, the climate change is the bauxite residue. These, these are my opinions. Now, I try to depict the sustainability. Sustainability depends who you read, which article you read, which companies, uh, marketing brochures you read. Sustainability is not one factor. Sustainability is not the carbon dioxide emission or hydropower. Sustainability is like an elephant. Is the elephant a snake or is the elephant a spear or is the elephant a wall or is the elephant a hump? So I have listed all the 10 items, bauxite residue, carbon dioxide emission, product combustion, PFC emission, downgrading meaning uh, using aluminum for lower grades, lower applications, spent part line, draws, aluminum in landfill, that is the worst, and aluminum tailing. My mind, bauxite residue is the number one problem we have to solve and not ever put aluminum scrap in the landfill. So those two are the number one and number two sustainability items that we sometimes ignore and we have to address slide. So how green is your aluminum? World is shifting to green aluminum or low carbon aluminum. Every time you read an article, they all talk about all the aluminum companies having green aluminum. But if you look into that, green aluminum basically means in their mind is that it is made of hydropower, which is only 10% of the world, world's production, or it is potentially could be used a technology such as inert anode. So that green may be green, but it's not sustainable. Focus is on hydropower and inert anode as we talked. Industry is also focusing on increased recycling of post-consumer scrap. In most countries, it is greatly successful. Brazil just hit 100% recyclability of used beverage can. US is low on the totem pole with less than 50% uh, recycling 
45% recycling rate. That's pretty low. Bauxite residue management continues to remain the neglected, the most neglected area of aluminum sustainability. I just wrote an opinion article in the London Metal Exchange, uh, LME, on the bauxite residue. Alumina that gives us green aluminum is extracted through a process that endangers lives and environment. And I can cite examples what happened in Brazil uh, twice, what happened in Hungary, and what potentially could happen in Iceland, and also what happened in uh, US Virgin Islands 30 years ago when hurricane hit the bauxite residue and, and bauxite piles and coated red, red particles all over the houses in and Virgin Islands. Without a viable solution for bauxite residue aluminum, aluminum, in my opinion, can never be too green. Green aluminum right now is most of marketing hype when we talk about hydropower, inert anode. Unless we solve bauxite residue, it is just a marketing strategy. It's not really effectively done. So here is the bauxite residue historically, how has it been managed? We have about 3 billion tons of bauxite residue inventory, 3 billion all over the world in almost all continent. And that inventory is growing about 150 million tons a year. So mine bauxite, bare process, hull hero cell, you make primary aluminum, and that loop is circular, except the used beverage cans in the US, which is not circular because more than half of them is going to landfill. But bauxite residue, it is not circular because we make bauxite telling, we make uh, bauxite residue, and less than five, less than four percent of what we make is is recycled. So, despite the claim of circular economy in aluminum product, used beverage cans going in landfill, and only four percent of the bauxite residue being used. I don't think we can claim to be a truly closed loop industry, either in the aluminum recycling rate or in the bauxite residue. Okay, so how, what, what damages have bauxite residue caused the world? Well, we all know what happened to hydro, alinotro, alinotro plant in Brazil in 2008 and 2018 that led to destructions of uh, human life and the ponds and drinking water and affected many indigenous people which who did, did not benefit from the economic success of bauxite making or aluminum making and then the very infamous uh, uh, problem or situation in hungary in 2014 and then one is brewing in iceland ireland on the, in the organist plant where uh, the bauxite residue pond may lead to the Atlantic Ocean. And this does not uh, show what happened in US Virgin Islands in the 1980s when the hurricane hit the island and deposited all the red bauxite residue and red bauxite all over the island. Okay, so there are some positive uh, outcomes. There are a few companies globally are working to mitigate bauxite residue. A couple of examples, I would say in Ukraine, uh, which now I understand is shut down because of the war. Uh, they were, before the shutdown, they were mitigating 250,000 per ton of bauxite residue. In Greece, I understand they're doing it now, 85,000 tons of bauxite residue. In India, in Hindalco, uh, as I read it and I've talked to folks in the company, about 2 million uh, tons per year is being mitigated. So the signing star is what's happening in, in India and in Greece and potentially what could happen in Ukraine uh, after the resolution of the production. And uh, Greece uh, also has a process, aluminum grease on mitigating quite a bit of aluminum residue and and hopefully all of this will continue. And there are some successful projects yet 
quite sparse. India's Hindalco has signed an agreement with Ultratech Cement to deliver 1.2 million tons of box iris to per year to be used as input. So that's a phenomenal positive development. <clears throat> Dubai's EGA is constructing a pilot plan to convert box iris due into soil production in association with University of Queensland, Australia. Hydro Elenorto signed a contract with Wave Technology to build aluminum residue processing plant in, in, in Brazil to process 50,000 tons per year of box iris. So these are the three positive uh, events that the US industry is doing to mitigate the problem that we have. So why is that the globally aluminum industry is not moving fast enough. Why is that our focus has moved on low carbon aluminum premiums? People are demanding and getting one cents or two cents per pound premium on low carbon aluminum, where it is made from hydropower, which itself gives you 40% economic advantages of variable cost why hasn't the incentive moved in bauxite residue? Why has the technology not been developed? I'm proposing that we should have incentives for bauxite residue reduction, which I call low bauxite aluminum premiums, Elbra. And like most economic uh, theories, if there's a premium attached to a product that the customers, automotive aerospace customer demand that we make bauxite using low or high resolution of bauxite residue, the technologies will persist. There's no lack of technology. There's no lack of effort, but there's no economic incentive. And I'm proposing that uh, high premium be given so that our customers in automotive and aerospace and used beverage cans they can say, yeah, we want not only low carbon aluminum because that affects, has a minimum effect on sustainability. We want the item that has the highest effect on sustainability, and that is not low carbon aluminum. That in my mind is low residue bauxite premiums. So here is my final slide, is that less suggest, I have suggested that to in my article with London Metal Exchange. So we need the global involvement uh, to make this happen as most aluminum is not made by hydro aluminum and most aluminum smelter cannot be retrofitted to inert anode. Let's focus on something that it is important and that is the bauxite residues. I'm saying that we should have a class of aluminum that's called low bauxite residue premium and have premiums based upon processing a ton or every ton of P2020 either from new production or from existing production. And I'm saying that the premium for existing production, existing box ratio should be twice as much compared to the premiums for a new production. And I'm saying that we're making four tons of bauxite residue per ton of aluminum. So for one ton or two ton or three ton or four ton of bauxite residue be mitigated, let's offer a discount, let's offer a premium going from 0.25% to 1%, which for $2,000 per metric ton, translates to $5 per ton to $20 per ton and double that amount for existing box residue going from half a percent to 2% or $10 to $40 metric ton. In my opinion, the technology exists. Technology is not implemented because it's not economical. And for us to have a sustainable aluminum industry, unless we solve the box residue problem, we really in all good conscience cannot claim that aluminum is a sustainable aluminum industry. Here are the challenges. Challenges are low carbon aluminum drive is currently focused on hydropower 
and high technology such as in Arnold. Arnold. Boxer is the most important criteria and we're not focusing on that. In my mind, as I said before, there's no such thing as sustainable boxer industry without mitigating the boxer residue situation. So we have talked about the challenges and problems. What are the action items? I've made some suggestions, global engagement from the aluminum industry and the sustainable leaders, maybe customers, create a LinkedIn group on boxer residue to share strategies, create a website dedicated to boxer residue mitigation plan, create a monthly focus group meeting, virtual meeting, so people globally can discuss, talk, and at least make some positive steps toward it. We, we can even set up a global nonprofit organization to educate and develop sustainable, sustainable products and process, processes. Now, is that enough? Yeah, if we have a 0.25% of $5 per metric ton of premium, for aluminum industry with $120 billion revenue a year, that, is, that corresponds to $300 million a year or $0.3 billion a year or $2.4 billion a year, year, year of additional revenue that companies who are engaged can devote to the technology and implementation of the aluminum box residue. Now, some references, uh, article that are published in Light Metal Age 221, the article or paper I gave at TMS uh, earlier this year, and the article they have written at LME's invitations that happened in March, and then I'm pretty active in LinkedIn promoting the issue of boxer residue and promoting the sustainability aspect of boxer residue. And I have linked, I have put the four links there, and you can also try to read my post on LinkedIn, and we can share from that perspective. And again, my name is Bodh Das. Here's my phone number. Here's my email address: skdasphoenix.net. The main purpose of this talk today is to understand, appreciate, and do something about something more about boxer residue. We don't want our boxer residue be, be our plastic island waking moment. We need to act now actively and try to preserve $120 billion industry. I thank you for your time, appreciate it, and hopefully we'll hear from you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Subodh Das, for excellent presentation. Um, Dr. Subodh Das is online, and I will give him some five minutes time to talk something uh, more about this presentation, and then the session will open for questions and answers. So over to Dr. Das, if any. Your sound is not working. Dr. Das, sound can you is not... Yeah, yeah, we can, can hear you. Okay, thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, share my thoughts on boxer residue and the main driving force is that low carbon aluminum is not the only uh, sustainability factor. And unless we solve the boxer residue, we really cannot claim ourselves to be sustainable industry. And, you know, my saying is that we all love our beloved, beloved aluminum industry, let's work together to make our industry lovable by solving the biggest problem that we have. And the purpose is to make awareness, assessment, action, and count on the accomplishments. I'm open for any questions and answers or share discussion. And this is a global issue, global opportunities to shine our industry for next 100 years. I'm open for any questions, Ashok. OK. So Mark Dupas no. has put some. Yeah, yeah, Kiran, please start. Start, Kiran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Das, um, as we know, there are a lot of areas across the world, in Brazil as well, uh, where there is a deforestation and the land is getting open. 
lot of rainforest is getting destroyed can we use red mud as a landfill and also develop a plantation uh, in that alkaline soil by uh, selecting plants which can grow into the alkaline media oh that's an excellent idea you know that's not my field of expertise uh, but that's something that could be funded that's something that industry should fund to to not only to mitigate box residue issues that we create and affect the local population also to help help us the reduce the defrostation so that could be an interesting topic or maybe the one of the first topic to study if there is interest and global global request to do something about that that's excellent it point possible. Uh, uh, so as, as a chemical engineer i can understand and i can guarantee there are plants which are available which can grow into big trees and can be used as a forest product industry uh, these plants can grow into alkaline media uh, above ph of 9 and above so that's an excellent our... idea what I, would, what I would suggest before we lose the thought that after the lecture kiran just send an email to ashok listing your ideas so one of the things we can do starting today and list all the 10 things that we hear today that potentially could be useful so please do us a favor send an email to show listing your idea which i think is an excellent we don't want to miss this opportunity of getting all of us together and not getting anything out of it so take take 10 minutes take 15 minutes write a paragraph write a page write one sentence send it to ashok so we don't lose your excellent chain of thought yeah but thank you boss. just, uh, thank you, just uh, if you i would like to intervene uh, already hindalco in their belgam plant is afforesting their all red mud area all the old red mud area so this is already some work already going on because uh, we know that uh, in belgam plant uh, there is a green cover has been developed on old bauxite residue uh, ponds so I think Kiran, you you may be aware about that thing also. So what kind of plants they are growing there? Maybe it's like which can withstand in in uh, alkaline environment. Uh, I I personally uh, I'm not sure, but I know um, from long distance there is a plant in in Africa which is called biobab, P I O B A B biobab. It's a medicinal plant, so you can derive. Uh, uh excellent medicine out of it like salicylic acid or uh, ibuprofen i don't know but this plant grows for years and it becomes a big plant uh, with a big diameter of the stem and this plantation can really help uh, mitigating the soil problem with the, with the red mud you use red mud as a landfill make a plantation and uh, grow the forest okay excellent okay please Okay, uh, Mark, you had given some comments. Please talk. Please talk because no, not everybody is reading your comments. Mark, hello, Mark. Mark Dupis. Yes, hi. Hmm. I have uh, access to a lot of papers because I I watch the uh, the Future Aluminium Conference in in Quebec City in. Uh, in May and before that at the fast market in April in Miami and that's a very uh, a topic that is discussed a lot uh, what to do with red mud and uh, they have very interesting solution presented in those paper I cannot share the, the paper here because I, I've tried and it's not accepting uh, files but uh, they are available to me so if anybody is interested uh, they can ask me yeah, I'm, I'm interested, Mark. So not please. a specialist in red mud uh, either, so that's why I cannot uh, really discuss about it. For re reforestation, there's an example in Jamaica in that paper that is, was presented in Miami. They have reforested the whole uh, red mud lake. Yeah, please send up some papers to me, Mark. Okay. And you see the comments, uh, Dr. Das, you uh, uh, put on the comments and you can see uh, you can copy these comments and uh, which mark has put it on the co comments column yeah I'm, I'm taking notes as well 
It, okay. it is very important, Red Mud. Uh, it's a big issue, but I would not say it's the biggest. For me, it's uh, CO2 is more important than Red Mud. Red Mud is only inert earth if you uh, neutralize correctly the 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 the, 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 the sodium. So, so it's not uh, as bad as uh, emitting CO2 in the air and uh, increasing the temperature and the climate. So I would say uh, it's more important to the aluminum industry to, to, to be carbon neutral as a priority. At least. And Renmud is, of course, if, if you want to claim that you have, you're producing green aluminum, you, you have to, uh, to, to have green bauxite uh, mining and green alumina production, and, and after that, green electrolysis. So it's all part of the same. If you cannot uh, claim zero emission and, and zero uh, waste production of aluminum, if you, you're making uh, any residue uh, along the line, that's for sure. Dr. Das. I mean, this is a matter of conjecture, uh, Mark. I, I understand your viewpoint, but my case is that you know, got three billion tons laying around and not doing any good. Uh, so I think everybody talks about carbon dioxide, which is fine. But you know, again, it's a question of my conjecture versus yours. I think box acidity is the most important uh, problem that we have to solve. And unless the red is out from the aluminum industry, we can never be green. Again, those are debatable conjecture, but that's mine. Okay. Anyway, the both are important, and 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 both will be expensive, uh -huh. and both will increase the price of production of aluminium. Yeah, it's still much better than waking up one morning and see the plastic island effect when people show the landfilling of used beverage cans using what's what's good of using low carbon aluminum made by hydro inert anode, and it makes aluminum some can in US and after 30 days goes to landfill. So what no, good is that? Good and the landfill is a big issue, but that's the culture issue. That's why in, in Germany, they recycle 99% of the, the aluminum and in, in US is uh, less than 50%, right? 45%. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so uh, it depends on the country. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, please, any more questions? Uh, Alex, anything? Uh, yeah, well, uh, from my perspective, uh, I guess one of the forums in which all the big players uh, participate is the uh, International Aluminium Institute. And at one point, the International Aluminium Institute had a roadmap uh, for uh, sustainability of the industry moving forward. So um, I guess what I'm trying to find out is uh, what is the International Aluminium Institute, which consists of all the major players. What is their uh, view about sustainability uh, in their roadmap? Uh, is, is the boxer residue as important to them as uh, maybe the carbon and uh, zero zero carbon issue? Yeah, Alex, I have seen the roadmap and I think they're doing an incredibly great job of making awareness and some mitigation solutions. So their effort is very commendable and yet there's much more to do my focus is not on the effort. My focus is the awareness. Everybody talks about aluminum and the low carbon. Aluminum and the carbon dioxide. Aluminum at one cent premium because it was made by hydro. I want to change the focus that it's like having a house where your basement is leaking and your roof is broken. And you're talking about the right, right uh, beautiful picture of Monet's painting in your wall. That's my contention is that unless we fix bauxite residue and landfilling, everything, in my opinion, is a marketing appeal. Um, these are my conjectures.
Uh, you muted us, Oak. You're muted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. Any more questions, Taku? Um, Dr. Das, is there any uh, proven technology today exist uh, to mitigate a red mud? I'm sure there are many technologies. It depends upon what products you're making. And that's something that we should have an effort, something that we should talk about as a, as a global community and, and saying that if you're successful in some parts of the world, why it is not successful in other parts of the world? Is it economic or raw material? So I think there are many review papers that have been written and published. And it's not lack of technology. I think it's like a will that prevents us from working on a box that has to do. Can it be made um, by law compulsory to treat red mud? I mean, I, I cannot speak on that part, uh, but all I know that uh, the plastic was the delivered materials worldwide and somebody showed the plastic islands and now you know what ha has happened to plastic. So in a, in, a, in a social media awareness, I would not want our bauxite uh, mud ponds in Brazil and Hungary to be the showcase of our, our industry. We don't want the landfilling aluminum can as a showcase. We want to show that we're doing something about these problems. So we can make laws, but laws will be different for every country. But what is universal is a social awareness that there is a problem, we're going to fix it. And I'm trying to prevent that from happening when somebody else shows the picture of bauxite residue pond leaking or shows the picture of huge amount of aluminum cans being a landfill. What is the number one technology today available to mitigate this? Maybe Ashok, you can answer that. No, because every country is doing their own efforts. For example, Chinese are extracting uh, iron and they are making uh, uh, pig iron and other, other products because China doesn't have good iron ore deposits. But each country is doing it its own efforts. For example, India because we are producing large quantity of cement. And uh, that's how the our uh, Hindalco is having their sister company, which is producing uh, cement. So they are uh, able to use 2 million tons per annum. But other cement plants are not able to use or other uh, is, uh, companies like Vedanta or maybe Nalco. Nalco is the worst example. Vedanta, they are putting up a, uh, high pressure filters and they are able to sell because if the moisture content can be reduced below 10 to 15 percent yes 20 percent below 20 percent they can sell to a, a cement plant but the distance becomes a criteria because transportation cost is higher than the actual uh, red mud so uh, and india is having a lot of laterite deposits so laterite mines are mostly which are located near cement plant they feed to cement plant so there are some issues are there, but efforts are going on for this cement uh, industry and also afforestation. And other things in India, since we have a lot of iron ore deposits, nobody is looking seriously working on the making pig iron or something from the red mud. Only Chinese are doing great work in this area. So after removing the iron, the red mud is uh, harmless? Yeah, absolutely. Then you can even think uh, as Dr. Das and others are working on uh, rare earths uh, or uh, trace elements and rare earths extractions and uh, rare metal extraction from the red mud. I think Dr. Das will be able to tell on this thing. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's a subject for other conversations. So the activities are continuing. Uh, globally to extract iron iron oxide uh, from red mud or boxer residue uh, there's some activities to extract rare earth elements uh, uh, but they're sparse and as a source said uh, different countries have different technologies depending upon the situation of the raw materials and economic incentives okay Okay. Hello. 
Hello. Okay, yeah. My yeah, name Tako, is please, please, yeah. Tako. And uh, I think that uh, the best way to reduce the generation of uh, oxide residue in the bio process is using the very high quality oxide. But unfortunately, uh, deposit of uh, high quality oxide is reducing, then we need to use low grade oxide from now on. In the case, the generation of uh, the amount of generated uh, red mud must be increased drastically in future. Yes. Then I think that we need to develop a new process to reduce the generation of uh, red mud. That is uh, one important issue. Of course, we need to develop many red mud usage process but uh, there is a big cost barriers, transportations or uh, processing. What are the best, best of our improved process, do you think, in future to reduce the red mud generated? Do you know that? I, I cannot, I don't have the direct knowledge of that, Ashok, so maybe somebody mm -hmm. else can chime in no no what he is telling very correct thing as bauxite quality is deteriorating there is a more red mud is being generated per ton of alumina yeah right. yeah so for example now you see in australia i think uh, alex also knows that uh, about four tons of bauxite is required to produce one ton of alumina because the uh, quality particularly in the darling range area in western australia what uh, uh, Versal refinery is using that 28% available alumina. So there's a huge quantity of red mud is being generated. Right. So and this quantity is going to increase in future because most okay. of the high grade bauxites are depleting. So the Takuo has uh, invented some proce procedure or method in, uh, uh, for improving the extraction of alumina from low grade bauxites. So that's what he's referring to his. Uh, no, that's a good point, Ashok. I mean, industry is growing 8% a year in aluminum production. That means it is also growing 8% in a year in bauxite production. And then if the quality of bauxite deteriorating, hmm. then will be more than four, could be five tons per ton of. So the, hmm. the good quality bauxite has already been gone to red mud pond somewhere hmm. and, and 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 waiting to be mitigated and the worst quality of bauxite is re ready to be ponded again thank you yes thank you anything more Taku? yeah thank you on the those you mentioned about uh, current trend of hindarko hindarko is uh, expanding cement application and uh, UAE for soil applications and yes. hydro uh, for iron. Yes. And, and as for hydro's uh, new technology, is it available one or not? I, I do not have direct knowledge of that. Uh, I have I've listed uh, based upon the published information so you probably were better off contacting somebody at hydro i don't have any direct knowledge of their strategy thank you <clears throat> okay thanks to you all uh, for a uh, wonderful well, presentation think, uh, dr das uh, yeah yeah please please alex alex yeah just 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 one last comment just one last comment. I think uh, what you are saying uh, is bringing awareness not only uh, to uh, to outsiders, but more to the people in the industry to be the ones taking the initiative to try and find a solution to the red mark issue. Because I think the worst that can happen is if uh, outsiders people who are not in the industry are the ones now agitating for something to be done about red mud 
deposits around the world. Hands when there is a catastrophe like what happened in Hungary or, or in Brazil. I think the more of such things that happen, the more uh, there will be social awareness. And then the cry for action will not be friendly, but more hostile to the industry. So uh, that is why I was uh, asking what the International Aluminium Institute, which is a forum for all the big players in this industry, are doing about this problem. They say they want to collaborate on this and come with a solution. But uh, in terms of red map, like you rightly say, not much action is happening there. So I think it's important for the, the big players to take the initiative and do something about a red map before social media or outsiders try to, uh, to uh, rise up in arms against the industry. That's the comment I want to make. Correct. I, I couldn't have said, said anything better than this. Uh, I mean, in this world of social media and global population involved, by picture, I am, I'm reminded of the in 1970s. There was a picture of a native or American Indian walking in Minnesota, and, and and he saw the destruction of a river there, and there's a tear on his cheeks, and that led to the formation of EPA, Environmental Pro Production Agency, Protect Agency in the U.S. So that's an iconic picture. You see a picture of Pacific Island, plastic island, and you know what has happened. Plastic is not sitting on the laurels. There are huge investments in how to make plastic, plastic more recyclable. And in our case, we're not taking it seriously. We're still talking about carbon dioxide and hydropower and our anode, which is great. But hydropower is only in five countries. And inner time cannot be retrofitted, in my opinion. Let's talk about something that affects everybody, all globally. We're not doing that. And like Alex, you say, it's better for us to aware and do something as opposed to somebody else fo focusing us, forcing us to do that. So that's the bottom line of my conversation today. Thanks, Dr. Das, for nicely uh, summarized. And uh, that's what uh, we should keep pursuing and uh, for the uh, growth of aluminum industry. Yeah, we should, uh, Ashok, before we, you know, uh, let's write down a couple of cent couple of bullet points that was brought up. And I've taken some notes. Maybe yeah. you and I will compare notes and we can send out at least to the attendees or to your listeners uh, a potential conversation uh, highlights. Sure. Thanks, uh, Dr. Das. We will will highlight these points. And uh, okay, and very good. Thank you for everybody attending. And thank you for making comments from Kiran and Mark and Alex and hmm. uh, Tokuyo. Uh, we appreciate all the comments that people made. And and it, it is a great day for me. I was able to talk to you guys and make you think. At least in my opinion, that what's important is the red. That's important. It's not the green. Let's focus on the red before red can become green. That's the bottom line. And Dr. Das, can we make a LinkedIn group of the attendees and uh, then that group can grow? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Let, let me work on it. I will make a box size residue LinkedIn group and then we invite uh, all the attendees. And so we can have a open conversation, you know, outside the corporate world, people who care about from the outside side so we can okay ashok let's work together on that one oh yeah thanks yeah sure sure but there is already red mud org is working in belgium they are also doing great work but certainly uh that's more research oriented work they are doing but certainly we can set up one uh lincoln uh, uh group and uh you can take the initiative and uh, we'll help we'll, you. we want me we want this group to be a policy oriented group awareness-oriented group, not the exclusively technology group, because it's not a technical problem. It is awareness and policy problem. It's not technology. Technology goes nowhere unless there's awareness and policy. Technology needs money. And if the money is going for low carbon, 1%, 1 cent premium, there's no money for bauxite residue. <laughs>
that's a good idea and let us promote this yeah one. but dr das do you feel that uh, yeah. if the awareness reaches on 0 to 10 scale more than 8 or 9 uh, a, a viable commercial technology can come into effect and can be developed I think if there's a funding available and if there is a plastic island in picture, anything is possible. We are trying to protect $120 billion industry. So 1% of that is 1.2 billion. $1.2 billion of global investment can bring a lot of good stuff. Okay. Understood. Yeah. That makes sense. Thanks. That's very nice. Okay. Right. Thank you, okay. everybody. I know yeah. my time yeah. is up. So Thank have you. a good day. Bye. 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 I'll see you. Thank you. Bye. Thank everybody. you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.